Hello and welcome to the second annual Community Research Expo. My name is Jessica Bellamy and my colleague Josh Poe and I started the Community Re the, the Root Cause Research Center in January of 2020. Our team at the Root Cause Research Center are researchers and tenant organizers. We believe in class struggle as a theory of change and organize at the intersection of property and policing to build a multi racial base of poor and working class tenants in the United States, specifically the South. We help build structured tenant-led campaigns and produce knowledge and solidarity with communities under threat of displacement, surveillance, and police violence. We also design inventive and interactive visuals that break down complex systems of oppression, that countermap dominant narratives, and that center the perspectives of people surviving at the center of the problem. The Community Research Expo is a community platform and base for radical scholarship that provides an alternative to traditional hierarchical and classist models of research, where really community members are used more as test subjects than as main researchers or as co-investigators of different problems that they're working on. And our CRC, our team, the radical scholars of the Community Research Incubator and our partners work together to produce knowledge and data as an alternative to dehumanizing and inaccessible research that is typically created by state and private institutions. The work created by these brave, remarkable revolutionary thinkers will shake you awake and will raise you up today. These works were constructed after nine challenging months of collective study, lively discussion, and multiple trips to small town archives. These works were made whole by deep personal conversations about power, place, and struggle. And both projects that you'll see today are just the tip of the iceberg of what these scholars are building towards. Each year, as scholars return and newcomers take a chance, together we set new standards for ourselves and what we can imagine. Each year builds upon the last and the work of Joyne Woodard, Woody Pryor and Mariel Gardner will lift the next movement scientist, the next rebel intellectual, the next militant bookworm, the next eager learner so that we can get to that next level that next level that is the revolution that our people deserve. This event is being recorded and the Root Cause Research Center will have it. We'll have it on our Facebook. And in a week's time, we're gonna put all of the materials that you see today, plus some additional things from our scholars on our website. And that'll be at www.rootcauseresearch.org CRE 2022. If you're on social media, we invite you to use hashtags like the CRE 2022, Solidarity Research, or Community Research. If you're active on Twitter, you can note that this event is being live tweeted from our Twitter account, which is at Root Research. And that's just to further document, to share out links that people discuss, and to continue to build a conversation. These moments aren't stagnant. We want to keep growing them with you. We invite viewers and attendees to use the Zoom chat, Facebook comments, or whatever you have access to, to, to react, to, to say something, to share your experience with us. Ask a question, tag a person, uh, voice, your voice is welcome in this space. And, and we encourage it to be something constructive and positive, but we always know that there will be questions and we can accept those questions. Finally, it is a great honor that I am able to introduce our keynote speaker, Jerome Scott. Jerome Scott is a member of the League of Revolutionary Black Workers. He serves on Move to Men's National Leadership Team and on the National Planning Committee of the US Social Forum. He is active in grassroots global justice and other social justice movement organizations, including the League of Revolutionaries for a New America. 
He was a founding member, member and former director of Project South Institute for the Elimination of Poverty and Genocide in Atlanta, Georgia. Jerome has also written numerous chapters and articles on race, class, movement building, and the revolutionary process. He is also a contributing editor to four popular education toolkits, including The Roots of Terror and Global and Today's Globalization. He was co-recipient of the American Sociological Association's 2004 Award for the Public Understanding of Sociology. Glorious audience, it's my pleasure to introduce Jerome Scott. Well, thank you. I really appreciate that. Um, I am really happy to be here with y'all today. I, um, when I was first asked if I were interested in doing this presentation, and I looked at who was asking me, the Root Cause Research Center, I thought, damn, I should definitely do this. With a name like that, how could I go wrong? You know, and it also brought, reminded me of um, a time organizing in the South back in the late 80s, early 1990s. And I, I um, was doing some work in West Alabama Black Belt around this whole question of absentee voting and how the attack on the voting rights, you know, actually took off at that point in the Black Belt of Alabama. And I ran into this guy named uh, Albert Turner. And he said to me, you know, when we're dealing with problems like this, there's only one way to go. And that is to get to the root of it. Because if you don't get to the root of the problem, that problem will keep coming back at you just like a bunch of weeds. And I thought, damn, that is really a good analogy because capitalism is like weeds. No matter how many times you reform capitalism, it will resurface in an even more reactionary form than it was when you reformed it before. And, you know, I, I guess the best example of that is the attack on voting rights today, which I think really took hold in. West Alabama doing those struggles around absentee ballots, you know, that, that's a whole reaction to the Voting Rights Act, you know, and the, the actual bringing into the voting process of these literally millions of Black folks around the country into the voting process. And this attack is being sustained today, you know, so this whole question of getting to the root is not only a good parallel to what we're doing, but it really tells us something. It tells us that if we're going to be successful, we have got to look at the problems that we're facing today and figure out what their roots are and dig them roots out. And we have certainly enough problems to deal with today. And I just want to hit on maybe three areas of um, discussion today. One, of course, is you know, the moment that we're living in, and this moment is filled with crises, and we'll get into that. The second was, is, you know, what, what are we fighting? And how should we be carrying out that fight? And the third, of course, is, what is our vision of the future? And how do we connect these everyday fights to that vision of the future? Because that's the process which will eventually get us out of this mess. So first of all, I mean, there's a multitude of crises that we're dealing with today. You know, first and foremost, I think, is the economic crisis. You know, many people are, are saying today that we're on the other side of the crises, that people are leaving their jobs and who knows what, you know, and, and our wages are being increased. Well, all that might be true for a few, but it's definitely not true for the vast majority of the people, particularly Southerners and people who live in Appalachia. You know, we're not seeing any kind of rebirth of the economy that they're trying to sell us on. The economy is only getting worse. I mean, everything 
uh, every institution that we think about in this capitalist society is struggling. And they're struggling not only from the economic crisis, but also that big uh, question that we're all faced with, and that is the climate crisis. You know, there's predictions that we only have about 10 to 12 years to get a handle on this crisis un until it's unhandleable. You know, it's out of, you know, it's out of our reach to control anymore. You know, existential crises, which fundamentally all of them are. But you got the economic crisis, you got the climate crisis, then you got the crisis of healthcare. I mean, come on. We are supposed to be the most advanced society in the world, but we can't deal with this pandemic? Or do we, are we afraid of dealing with the pandemic will hurt the capitalist system so much that we can't afford to do it that way? But at any rate, this 900,000 people have died in this process and we still haven't figured out how to deal with it. And then, of course, there's the political crisis. You know, the, the whole crisis of how are we going to get something done in this country when the supposed two parties are both, you know, falling apart from one angle and struggling with each other. But really, you know, this whole question of whether or not the political system is working in this society is pretty clear to everybody that it is hopelessly broken, you know, and the two-party system has proven that it can't function for the benefit of working and poor people throughout this country. And so not only are we dealing with the economic crisis, the crisis of climate, the political crisis and state violence, police is on the wild again, you know, but we're also dealing with this crisis that no one seems to want to talk about, and that is the fundamental transition that we're going through in this capitalist society, you know, in terms of just the, the way things are produced and distributed. You know, this whole uh, roboticization, you know, and, and, and this whole, um, this, this process of moving from industrial production to electronic production to artificial intelligence influences on production. You know, and what that means is that in the long run, literally millions and millions of workers will not be needed to function in order for this uh, society to be productive, you know, in this new world that we're gradually going into. But when you think about how the institutions of this country, I don't care which one you want to talk about, the educational institute, the health institutions of this country, the police institutions of this country, every one of them is in crises. And they're in crises because the world is in transition. We're transitioning from that industrial-based society to a more technologically generated society. and. What that means is that it brings every institution up for question because it, they can't function during this transition. Everything is weakened. Everything is a little bit off kilter. You know, and we don't talk too much about that because it affects each and every one of these other transitions. But the thing that I think we need to think about, particularly uh, when we're talking about root causes, is what is the root cause of each and every one of these crises? Because so that's what we got to get to. You know, I think that that answer is very simple, that the root cause of this situation that we're in, in, in terms of economic crisis, is capitalism. Capitalism demands maximum profit. That means maximum exploitation. The climate, you know, if it's not for the capitalists demanding that they have to have unfettered expansion into nature that eventually releases all these impurities into society that we hadn't counted on and therefore the basis of the, this pandemic and the future pandemic. 
you know, the political crisis, police violence. How do you keep order when everything is up in the air and everything is in transition? You have to strengthen the police. You have to unleash the police. And then, of course, this is because capitalism and all this new, the struggle to not only make a profit, but to maximize your profit, meant that you have to get into instituting different technologies in production. And that set the basis for this transition from industrial-based production to computer and technology-based production. You know, so that's, this moment is very, very critical and, and very moving, very much in motion, because we also have, over the last few years, the biggest resistance developing throughout this country. I mean, after the George Floyd murder, you had more demonstrations in this country than we had in the 60s at one time, and more people in motion than we had in the 60s. And that's important because, you know, one of the things that I have lived by most of my life is you will only get what you're organized to take. And if they believe that we're organized to take over this society, then they have to do something very dramatic to try to prevent that. And that's what I think is happening with this next point. What are we fighting? immediately today. I know we're fighting capitalism in the long run, but we're also fighting the different forms that capitalism brings before us. And one of the things that we're fighting today is this movement toward fascism, you know, this attack on voting rights, this attack on education and, and the so-called critical race theory, uh, people taking that struggle up. And, you know, there isn't a school system, a public school system in the country that teaches critical race theory. But you got all these states putting forth these uh, proposals to ban critical race theory from their educational curriculum. That's all a part of this process to consolidate a fascist base, a social base for fascism that's going on in this country. You can bind that with the, the attack on voting and trying to make sure that uh, people's ability to vote is restricted as much as possible. And the increase in police violence and police attack and state violence and state attack throughout this country, you can see that there's this motion and consolidation toward fascism. Now, many times people hear this term fascism and they're not sure exactly what it means. First of all, fascism is not separate from capitalism. You know, right now we're supposedly living under a state organizational form of so-called democracy, you know, where we have a constitution and supposedly the rule of law is the state of things here. And we all know how that goes. The rule of law is, it's a hell of a democracy for rich people but it's not much of a democracy for the rest of us, that's for sure. But at any rate, we call that democracy. This movement toward fascism is a change that state form of organizing from a so-called democracy to direct fascism. And one of the first things that the fascists do is suspend the constitution. What that means is that we're talking about moving toward a position where if you grew, if you lived and grew up in the South, you would you know this because of the history of the South, where the local authorities of the law is the law. There is no protection. There is no constitution. There is no grievance procedure. You know that when you suspend the constitution, you leave it up to the local authority to institute whatever laws they want to. And you know what that means in the South and Appalachia. That means some of the most reactionary, some of the most brutal actions by the state that you could possibly have. And that's what we're moving to. And many times I ask myself, is this a Donald Trump notion? And you know, that's what they're trying to get us to believe. They're trying to get us to believe that fascism is a Donald Trump notion. And that if we can just get rid of Donald Trump, we can get rid of fascism. Come on, folks. 
We already opened this session with saying we live in a class society. I think we live in a class society whose DNA is white supremacy. But what that means is that this motion toward fascism is a class motion. Donald Trump might be at the head of it for the moment, but it's a class motion. There is a certain percentage of the ruling class of this country that sees fascism as their only savior. That's the reason they're trying to move toward consolidating their social base and consolidating this whole movement toward fascism. Because they think that we're on the thrust of getting organized to take what we want. And they got to prevent that at all costs. And they think fascism is the only way to prevent uniting that section of the class that can be united, that section of the working class. So that's the reason they're moving towards fascism, not because they want to, but be because they will do anything to protect their ability to exploit and oppress. Because in a capitalist economy, the only thing that's really important is maximizing profit. And that's what they think fascism will do, will continue their ability to maximize profit. Now, the, the, the question that I think comes up though, is while we're fighting fascism, which is a, you know, a political organization of society under capitalism, it's important for us to remember what our vision of this struggle is. Because our vision of this struggle is not just to defeat fascism. That's not enough. Because defeating fascism will only mean we'll go back to the so-called democracy that we live in now. And each and every one of you know as well as I do that the way society is organized now is detrimental to our health, detrimental to our community, and detrimental to our livelihoods. So we so that's not a viable vision for what we're fighting for. We want to stop fascism, but in the final analysis, we want to fight for a society where we eliminate poverty, you know, where, where there is no such thing as uh, people having to have insurance to get health care, that health care is a right for every person in this country. You know, we can have a society like that because we have the technological ability to provide that sort of society where no one will be hungry, no one will be without health care, all of the essentials of life are provided. Not because we want to be charitable, because that's the way we can build a society that will eventually develop into a society without war, you know, a society without exploitation, and a society eventually without white supremacy. And that's the vision of the world that we want to build, and that's the vision of the world that we can organize ourselves to get. And I, my last point on this whole thing is, what will it take to get there? I think the most important thing that we have to do in this moment is the first and foremost, we have to organize ourselves and educate ourselves. Political education becomes the glue between our organizing efforts. We have to understand what capitalism is and be able to convey that to the people that we're working with on a day-to-day -day basis. Every day, we have to teach something and learn something. You know, that's part of this struggle because in the final analysis, we should know that this movement that we're fighting is to, at the minimum 70% intellectual. What that means is that yes, we have to fight on, you have to daily fight. But if that fight is not an educated fight, it's not a fight that has a vision for the future, that understands that our strategic goal is to eliminate capitalism from this world and create a basis for the development of a society, you know, where competition is eliminated and we can thrive together as a society. Some people call that socialism. I think that that socialism is a society and I, while we're talking about socialism, I think it's important to mention that socialism is not a destination, y'all. It's a transition from capitalism to communism. And socialism is the, is the 
area of intense struggle, you know, because we're going to have the reaction, you know, the counterattack of the bourgeois forces, the ruling class forces during socialism. We're going to have to fight to eliminate white supremacy and exploitation during that period of socialism. So socialism is not a destination. It is a transition period that we can set the basis for this future that we all desire and that we're fighting for. And with that, I will stop and turn it back over. But thank you for having me, and I have enjoy and I will be around to enjoy the rest of this. Wow! Let's take a moment and just give Jerome a big hand. Thank you so much. I don't know about y'all, but I am filled up. Um, Jerome, you've been a big hero of ours for a long time, and we really appreciate you coming and kind of blessing the mic for us. My name is Josh Poe. I'm a tenant organizer with the Root Cause Research Center. And this part of the presentation today, we're gonna to turn it over to some comrades that we work with. We decided to share this space with some of our comrades that have supported us or worked adjacent to us over the past year or so. Some people are gonna be presenting live, some people sent in videos. And so with that, I am going to play the first video, which will be uh, the group called Activist. Activist organizes around fiscal justice and is releasing a report later this month that is specific to Louisville. And with that, I will start the video. Hi, my name is Chelsea McDaniel. I'm a senior fellow with Activist. Hold on just a second. Hi, my name is Chelsea McDaniel, and I'm a senior fellow with Activist. Hello, my name is Mayor Radway, and I'm a senior analyst at Activist. Um, first, I just want to thank the Root Cause Research Center, um, not only for inviting us to be an important, a part of this important research expo, but, but also for being close partners who've helped us to gain insight into the unique fiscal justice issues in Louisville. Fiscal justice is activist's late multi-layered critical analysis of the equity of municipal budgets. Measured at the intersection of fiscal health and racial justice, we base our approach on the belief that cities realize stronger fiscal outcomes when they prioritize the well-being of their most marginalized residents. You know, that should come as no surprise that that is what cities ought to focus on, um, and, and oftentimes they fall very short of that. So. Most obvious has been the harm done to communities of color. Less obvious is the deepening fiscal crises municipalities face as they pay the increasing costs of fiscal justice risks. Lawsuits, over-policing, and shrinking revenues among numerous others. You know, relying on over-policing to um, solve, you know, social issues or rather lack of investment um, in social uh, outcomes for residents, I believe. So in March, we'll be launching a report um, on Louisville, a kind of uh, first fiscal justice, first public fiscal justice uh, analysis of some of the key issues in Louisville. And um, then this time, I just wanted to share a few of those key insights in the short time that we have. So some of our key insights um, include just, just the framing of this. So big picture, Lewis analysis in Louisville um, has identified nearly 90 million in combined lost revenue and added expenses um, from things like corporate tax giveaways, police settlements, lost occupational tax, um, and additional uh, TIF zones, including the, um, the new Western TIF, uh, TIF zone. The, the cumulative impact, if we're looking at that on the annual budget, is about 13% of the annual budget. Let's see, so in terms of uh, corporate tax payments, so I mentioned that, um, on average, uh, we're assuming that um, Google has lost about $11.7 million in revenue annually. Uh, to kind of put that in perspective, in 2019, so last you know, budget year before um, COVID, where we kind of normalized numbers there, um, the, the city spent about $20 million on public libraries, uh, $20 million on health and wellness. Um, so about half that budget uh, is, is represented by this, this revenue number just from tax payments that we're saying is kind of forgiven. So, and, and to clarify what I say when um, when I'm talking about corporate tax payments, it's money that these corporations um, would have paid, you know, normal tax revenues to pay for, you know, being a part of the city and the operations and services that a city provides for that. And the city um, basically, is, you know, just says you're not obligated to pay that amount, right? And so, um, 
the city has been has been trying to in, in a way run on a deficit of additional tax revenue you have increased costs you know by having these other entities here um but you neglected to collect the the tax revenue to actually cover that um uh, the other area i think we talked about is that we, we found our research was the occupational tax revenue so um, with those black unemployment rate 11 percent is more than triple that of white residents 3.5 percent with white residents making on average twenty five thousand seven hundred more than black residents. Lower income for black and Latinx communities results in approximately 7 million missed occupational tax revenue per year for Louisville Metro. Inequality results in lower income for black and Latinx residents, which translates to less, ta less tax revenue and reduced business investment for the city. Louisville has either neglected to address these gaps or in many cases invested in resources in ways that exacerbates its disparities. The, the social argument is clear, right? You need to be investing in people to help close uh, this wealth gap. But I think the argument um, that's made that we're trying to tease out here in the research is also that there's, an, there's a significant upside for the city as well, um, that investing in people and closing this, this gap um, leads to additional tax revenue uh, for the city. The last thing I'll say is that um, looking at the city's economic development policy and then their recent um, push to create the West End TIF zone. The city has chosen to prioritize property over people designating the city's largest historically black neighborhood as a TIF district, the West End TIF. And what that basically means is that um, rather than investing in things that residents have actually asked for, that these people have a financial, positive financial and social um, return on investment. Now public funds, by the way of the TIF, are paying for gentrification, while residents are evicted and displaced. Using TIFs in this way is unethical, very expensive, and not a good investment. This not only gives first claim on the incremental tax revenue for up to 20 years to developers and corporations, but also places them ahead of school, children, affordable housing, public health, and workforce investment. Given Louisville's long history of forced displacement of West End residents, local advocates are highly and rightly concerned that the TIF will effectively make it cheaper to gentrify the West End, inflating the cost of living beyond what is affordable for current residents by building market rate developments, inevitably pricing them out. So those are just some of the key highlights in this report. Um, there's a lot more in detail in there, and we're very excited to um, share these insights not only with um, the with the market, but also the community. Um, to hopefully just serve as another tool uh, to to keep pushing for more equitable outcomes um, in municipalities and, and how um, and, and particularly in the council uh, Note for activists: we regularly work with community organizers. Um, and, and community organizations, uh, we think that's where a lot of this, the important data and insights lie uh, within cities. So um, if that's you, you know, we'd love to connect with you. Or your community organization has data around our fiscal justice indicators, such as policing, public health, like asthma rates or clean water issues, housing data on evictions or displacement. We invite you to contact us as we develop a broader community partnership. And thank you to the Crowds Research Center, uh, Jessica and Josh for organizing this. Um, I'm so glad we can be a part of it. Join our mission. Follow us on Facebook, LinkedIn, or Twitter, or visit our website, activist.org, and subscribe for our latest updates so you can be in the know when the full Louisville report drops. We encourage you to share with your neighbors and hope it can be a tool to push for better decision making in Louisville. Thank you. Great. Well, thank you all. And with that, the next person I want to introduce is Louisville Council person, Ja'Cory Arthur. We're really proud of the relationship that we've developed with Ja'Cory. We don't work with a lot of elected officials, but we decided early on that we had the same, a very similar self-interest around housing, anti-displacement, anti-gentrification. And with that, I will turn it over. Peace, and thank you so much. I'm Ja'Cory, councilman for Louisville Metro District 4. Uh, this little girl is asleep on my chest is my daughter, Aaliyah, and you might hear my son, Apollo, in the background every now and then, my four-year-old. We live in the Russell neighborhood. We are residents of Russell, proudly uh, living here. I'm originally from the Parkland neighborhood, and over the course of time, I've been working as a musician slash activist slash teacher uh, to do everything I can to, to just help the people around me from friends and family that I grew up with. And over the course of time, I realized it was going to take a lot more than just teaching about and singing about and rapping about issues. Uh, so I decided to run for office and here I am representing downtown Louisville 
and parts of the surrounding neighborhoods. You know, jumping on what Josh just said, it's important to realize that, in my opinion, and I hope in other elected officials' opinions, and I hope in your opinion, I do not work for government. I do not work for Louisville Metro government. I might work in government, I might work through government, but I do not work for government. I work for you. I work for the people on this call. I work for the people watching on Facebook. I work for the people in these photos uh, who are in various neighborhoods in the West End of Louisville, the most black, beautiful, brilliant part of the Commonwealth of Kentucky. And over the course of centuries, we've gone through so much as a people, even though we have contributed even more as a people, literally building this country, building the state, building the city that we're in. And even though we've contributed so much, we've been striving and fighting to live, we're still in 2022 under attack, whether we talk about modern day lynchings from police, uh, whether we talk about political violence, economical violence, we are under attack constantly. It's something that I was very much so focused on as a musician and carrying into office is the idea of us having the right to remain in our neighborhoods. And I think one of the more modern approaches to this attack is not necessarily to, to come and physically attack you, but to attack you at your place of living. As you heard earlier, we're constantly being priced out. We're constantly being pushed out and displaced from our residents. And if you can't afford a place to live, it's almost like you can't afford to live. There's nowhere for you to go except for being maybe unhoused in a junkyard, um, incarcerated in a prison yard, or dead in a graveyard. And for a long time, there's been so much work being done and people fighting to address this issue and it seems like an excuse was always that we can't do anything in the state of Kentucky because Frankfurt holds the keys to power. Until now. I'm proud to say that through collaborations with the Root Cause Research Center, through collaborations with residents, Smoketown, Russell, uh, Chickasaw, Parkland, Newburgh, Berrytown, and so many neighborhoods in between, we are going to introduce an ordinance titled the Historically Black Neighborhoods Ordinance, creating a new chapter of our local code of ordinances to address displacement. Now, this is important because it's a new chapter with all of the issues that have taken place in Louisville over the course of time. But it's also important to state that this is really a new approach that through our research, we haven't found in the state, in the region, and in the country. Because usually when you talk about historical preservation, you're talking about uh, preserving property. The purpose of this ordinance is to preserve the people who occupy that, pop that property, who work in those areas, who play in those areas, who worship in those areas, who are in those areas, and for a long time really only had those areas to go. So we're hoping to recognize, retain, and restore historically Black neighborhoods. So let's walk through the ordinance, because uh, sometimes we get legislation filtered through mainstream media, the, the language you're about to see is directly from the ordinance itself. No cookie cutter. We're going to dive in it, you know, look at some of the whereas clauses, the justification behind it. And then I have a call to action that I'd love for your help on. So Black neighborhoods, as you know, over time have really been the only places that we could be, whether that's the only places we could afford economically, the only places we were allowed uh, through political violence known as segregation and Jim Crow. These were the places where uh, we had the most belonging and the, had the most sense of belonging. But over time, these neighborhoods have been destroyed because of gentrification, because of being priced out, because of targeted racism. We know that over time it's gotten worse. You know, the cost of living constantly rises, wages stay the same. If you look at living wages within Louisville, Kentucky, they're about twice the amount of the actual minimum wage, which is actually blocked at the state level. We as a city are looking at how this impacts residents in neighborhoods like Russell, Smoketown, 
the Western and Louisville in general, opportunity zone areas that have been federally designated. And even though we know about the, the cost rising in general, we all often look at the way it impacts people and the numbers. So I wanna just go through a few different areas in two specific neighborhoods. Uh, this census tract is in the Western part of the Russell neighborhood. In 2010, as you can see, overwhelmingly uh, black population. But when we get into 2020, that black population dropped. And you might think, oh, that's only you know seven, eight percent, but it equates to 495, almost 500 black people gone. Let's look at Smoketown on the other side of 9th Street, 2010. Again, majority black. But when you fast forward to 2020, that population drops significantly. 566 black people gone. Jumping back to Russell specifically, where we have the, the beach and terrace development that just took place over the past few years, 2010, overwhelmingly black. And here we are in 2020, significant changes. Almost 2,000 black people gone. This is nothing new. Gentrification has been an issue in Louisville and specific neighborhoods have changed over time since 1990. And just to contextualize how gentrification is slow and dangerous and it moves, I was born in 1992. So since I have been born over the course of my life, the neighborhoods you see listed have changed dramatically in terms of income levels, in terms of racial demographics. And local government has already gone on record through our housing needs assessment and said they have a role, they have a responsibility to make sure they are addressing the challenges of displacement. They even go as far as in our comprehensive plan from the same year that was implemented, saying that as neighborhoods evolve, they want to discourage displacement. And if you're from Louisville, you probably know that none of this has happened. That plan goes even as far as to say non-residential expansion should not happen unless there is some sort of demonstration it won't have an adverse impact on residents in that area. Government goes beyond that to say the resources they have from land and incentives have to be revised so that they're not displacing people. And that's where we come in. This was all realized in 2019, likely before, but it was on paper in 2019. And now here we are in 2022, just doing something about it because we have you, because we have a community of people organized to fight back. So when we recognize these neighborhoods, we're looking at boundaries that were really established when they were freedom colonies, when they were the only places people could go, freedmen going to these specific communities and creating a place called home. After we recognize these areas, we're going to retain these areas with a displacement assessment, looking at the rent around the specific neighborhood, looking at the incomes in the neighborhood, looking at the cost of materials that might get sold within that place, if it's a, a, a retail center of some sort, a commercial parcel. That's important because if whatever development is being proposed does not pass that displacement assessment, Louisville Metro government will not support it. So if you can't afford it, we will not help that developer build it. And that goes for using our land, our property, our funding, and any other local incentives, and in some cases, even our employees. But we don't wanna just be in a mode of, of blocking development. So what we're trying to do is make sure if we have the audacity to help developers get subsidized, we need to make sure that residents in those areas have the subsidies they need to develop their own homes. So we're going to codify we're going to codify a land return policy that allows people to file claims freely and openly file claims to get land back if their family lost it from some sort of historical injustice, urban renewal, discriminatory practices and redlining, 
foreclosures. If your family lost it and Louisville Metro government or the former city of Louisville government, Jefferson County government was responsible, you can file a claim to get that land back, get that property back free of charge. Of course, if somebody's occupying it, we'll look for something comparable. Now, you all might be wondering how the hell are we gonna get this passed? I've learned real quickly over the course of last year, being able to pass legislation like the Crown Act banning discrimination against natural hair, a reparations resolution that went to the desk of President Joe Biden and Vice President Kamala Harris and congressional leadership, making sure that affordable housing money is earmarked for families at the lowest level of income. You can pass anything legal as long as you have 14 votes on the Louisville Metro Council. And the Black Caucus or districts one through seven of Black elected officials are half of those votes. But we can't do it without community. Every piece of legislation that we have introduced has had support behind it. The Crown Act had two little Black girls, 11 and 12, who brought that to me, who worked with me on that, who actually spoke at the council meeting to advocate to get that passed. You can provide feedback. You can attend community meetings. You can share this ordinance with your friends and family, talk about the issue with them, ask your council member to co-sponsor, come and speak at a council meeting. You are very much so a part of the work that needs to be done in this city. And as I told you, we've known about this in writing through reports since at least 2019 and nothing has been done about it. No protections for you and your family. So if you want more information, if you want to build with us to make sure this gets passed this year, louisvilleky.gov slash district four, you can sign up for our weekly e-news, you'll get a text, you'll get an email, and you can come and build with us. Because if we don't protect our neighborhoods, I don't think anybody else will. I appreciate y'all having me. Thank you, Ja'Cory. Also saw that people had some uh, questions in the Q&A. We're going to do Q&A at the end. We're going to, so we'll just hold all your questions to the end. We're going to set about 15 minutes aside for that. Uh, next, folks, up, um, I'm not going to tell their story because they tell it wonderfully, uh, but we were really honored to get to work with the Bedford County Listening Project down in Shelbyville, Tennessee last year, who are doing some amazing housing organizing. I'm going to turn it over to Kara Grimes and Stephanie Isaacs. Thank you all. Hey everybody, um, my name is Stephanie. Um, I'm with the Bedford County Listening Project. Um, I started it um, back in 2017. I also just wanna say it's such an honor to be on this call with all of y'all doing the good work. Um, and now I'm gonna tell you a little bit about how we got started. Um, and just to preface this, Shelbyville is a rural southern small town nestled in Trump company and Trump country sorry um let's see so back in 2017 there was a white supremacist rally and I wanted to know why people like that thought it was okay to come here the white supremacists were talking like Bernie Sanders saying everybody needed their you know needs met except people of color so Kelly and I started door knocking to see what we could do to meet people's needs before they did door knocking began. We met a lot of folks. We did a lot of front porch sitting. Um, substandard housing was everyone's complaint. I met mothers who didn't have plumbing or working toilets. I saw heartbreaking things that I couldn't shy away from. Um, we created and gave renters door by door a community survey to fill out that focused on housing and rental challenges. And we spoke to more than 230 renters. We released our survey on City Hall in 2020. This survey showed that of those we gave it to, 94% of renters, especially with lower income, faced a myriad of issues finding safe and affordable housing. By empowering renters, going after the city of Shelbyville and questioning our rights as renters, we have succeeded in, a, in multiple ways. We had a renter vigil during the early onset of COVID to open discussion about evictions during the pandemic. We stopped more than 200 evictions during the pandemic by informing people of their rights and how to stand up for them. At the same time, we also targeted a major landlord in Shelbyville. And during the action taken, that landlord stopped illegally cutting power. We showed up and spoke out against an anti-refugee bill to stand with our Somalian neighbors. And we had several media hits. 
um, where renters shared their stories. We are starting to be recognized across the country. And I was also elected to the city council in 2020 as a renter by renters. It showed that even in a Republican conservative dominant area, people care deeply about renter rights. By campaigning on a renter rights platform, people were motivated to take action and believe that change is possible when the solutions are based on our actual experiences and things that affect our everyday lives. And earlier this year, the BCLP won an improvement to the codes department where code violations have to be remedied before being closed, which was not the case previously. Y'all, people power matters. We cannot win this by ourselves. We must show up for our neighbors, all of our neighbors, and not let them divide us. And we know that everyone deserves affordable and safe housing. And now I'm gonna pass it on to Kara to talk about what we have going on now. So as you heard, we are a group of renters here fighting for better rental rights and holding those accountable that should be helping and not hindering our community. I personally joined the BCLP because my landlord who has left a hole in my ceiling since I've moved in and has not fixed it, which means when it rains, it rains in my bathroom, who has harassed me in the form of threats, evictions, and attempting to scare me off needs to be held accountable for all of his actions. All of the landlords here need to be held accountable. The city needs to be held accountable. The BCLP has shown me their strength in numbers and we will gain power and win if we fight together. Right now we are working on launching a campaign for a tenant bill of rights that will give renters the things we need and deserve. We as renters who know that we, did, we have issues that deserve change band together and created a bill of rights that includes safer housing free from bugs, mold, and raining bathrooms such as mine. It gives us accommodations for disabilities, protections from illegal evictions, and retaliation. These are things that should be included as these are basic human rights that like we deserve. <laughs> we should not feel as though we have to be rewarded for good behavior. This holds those accountable that are stripping us from living safely in our community, as well as puts our elected officials on the spot to openly say whether they agree as, that we as tenants deserve these rights. To keep up with our work, or if you're a renter who needs help, you can find us on Facebook by searching the Bedford County Listening Project and check out our website. Our website is thebedfordcountylp.org. Thank you. Thank you so much, Stephanie and Kara. Love what you're all doing down in Bedford County. Uh, next comrade that we're uh, asking to come up is Rebecca Ward from Clove the West. And we really wanna highlight our mutual aid partners in these spaces. Thank you, Rebecca. Hello, you all. Thank you all for having me. I am Rebecca Ward, and I am the creator and founder of Clothe the West. And what Clothe the West is, is a mutual aid organization that provides folks in the community free new essentials just because. Um, we believe that folks deserve new items without having to fill out a whole bunch of paperwork or having to meet criteria. So we remove that barrier and we pop up in the West End of Louisville and we provide whoever provides stuff to folks, whoever shows up. Um, and we pop up in the West End because that's the best end. And I um, originally, I came from um, the West End, 32nd in Kentucky. And so the West End holds a special place in my heart. And so we pop up there, but we'll serve folks who come from anywhere. And we started in 2000 during the uprising and folks, especially white folks were like gung-ho, wanted to help, wanted to get involved. And then folks went back to business as usual, but there was still a need that needed to be met. And so Cold the West has still been meeting that need. Um, and we are thriving. We are thriving even though folks went back to business as usual. Um, and that is upsetting, but I call folks out as much as possible. We are not a nonprofit. We are not um, an LLC. That's also what sets us apart in how we serve. Um, we do have a physical sponsor um, at the moment, and our goal is to become a nonprofit in the future. 
but right now we thrive off community support um, and donations from the community so that we can serve the community. And so our goal is to continue to serve the community. If folks reach out to us and we have something that we can provide for them, we take that to them. We don't ask a whole bunch of questions because I think that's important. I don't think people should have to tell their story in order to be served. I don't think that I need to know somebody's trauma in order to provide them with something. So that's super important to us. I will drop our information um, in the chat as well so people can connect with us. We are on social media. Um, we also do fundraisers and stuff like that. We have a fundraiser coming up that's called Egg My Yard. And so we will take um, eggs to folks' yards and the Easter Bunny. And so that's super dope. We, we are um, starting an initiative to deliver fresh flowers to folks in the West End, whoever shows up. Uh, I mean, whoever reaches out to us and says they want fresh flowers, we will, I will bring them to them um, because people deserve fresh flowers and that's important. And we are starting a birthday initiative as well where um, folks reach out to us because people deserve to be celebrated no matter where they are and what, what walks of life they're in. Um, people have birthdays and that's important and people deserve to be celebrated. So we'll be delivering cakes and stuff like that to folks. So connect with us on social media. If you have a event, we will definitely pop up. If you need us to pop up, um, we'll bring whatever we have or whatever fits the event. Again, um, my name is Rebecca Ward, Support Flow the West. Um, thank you all so much for having me. Thank you, Rebecca. And Misty Skaggs from Eastern Kentucky Mutual Aid was gonna be here, but she's not able to make it because she's doing mutual aid work. And so we wanna highlight that we appreciate donations. A lot of people on here appreciate donations, but if you do feel compelled to donate today, please prioritize the mutual aid groups in your donations. Their work supports our work. And with that, uh, I'm gonna move kind of fast because we're a little over time. With that, the next group we've asked to step up and present is the HBN Assembly, and Martina Konecki is going to be representing them. Hello, everyone. Thanks for having me today. Thanks to Ruth Cause. Research Center for staging this event. Let me first say that uh, I first became a root aware of root cause uh, when I started reading their work uh, regarding tenants' rights, uh, displacement, and that sort of thing. And then with the birth of the Historically Black Neighborhood Initiative, I was really drawn in. I'm president of an organization called Neighborhood Planning and Preservation. We've been advocating for neighborhoods all over Metro out, uh, count, uh, all over the Metro District since 2003. And I was glad that Jacori brought up the issue of preservation. We're often demonized as preservationists. People forget our name as Neighborhood Planning and Preservation. And people also forget that in 2003, we attempted to make the Russell uh, neighborhood a historic preservation district. We worked with the community, uh, our neighborhood association at that time to get the, um, the signatures. We raised the money. The money is still being held by Metro uh, Louisville. And that's an interesting story how that was blocked. So the, the creation of the Historically Black Neighborhood Initiative was very intriguing to me because of my work with West End communities in general. Also, because I'm a child of California, I currently live in uh, the Shawnee area. That being said, uh, once the TIF initiative started rolling down the hill, I reached out to HBNA to ask them for assistance or at least a talk about what this TIF was going to mean. Uh, under the auspices of MPP, we've been fighting TIFs for years and all sorts of tax abatement uh, scholarships, if you will, to the large development community. So I was so pleased to uh, join 
the assembly as a resident, but then also to join with the assembly to entice other communities to join with us to fight the West End TIF. Uh, we've made some accomplishments over the last year. We have raised uh, public awareness about problems with the way the law was passed. It was passed shortly before midnight, just uh, a few hours before midnight, uh, the very last day that the legislation was going to be in session with no public input on the front end and a concerted effort to keep people clueless until it was passed. Fighting the TIF is like a lot of the battles that MPP has fought over the years. First of all, you're told it's a done deal. You are faced with the barrier of folks who look like you and sound like you. They know the lingo, but they do not have the same objectives in mind. I was so happy to hear Jacory talk about how he works for us and not for the government. And unfortunately, that is not a... Uh, sentiment that's held by our public officials uh, and by the, the, uh, the network that supports them. They believe we work for them and they believe they can, in our name, acquire grants, acquire large amounts of funds to do what they want. Displacement has always been an issue in the black community. Uh, those of us of African descent know that we were brought to this country for the purpose of uh, making a profit off our backs and that we were never allowed to have a home of our own that we could declare our own. Someone in the chat a while ago uh, asked, well, what about desegregating neighborhoods? How can you desegregate neighborhoods if you don't displace? Well, I I'm going to leave you all with this. No one ever says, let's run to the East End and desegregate all those neighborhoods to make things better. There is nothing wrong with neighborhoods that are predominantly black, predominantly poor, predominantly whatever. What is wrong is that we have allowed the folks who work for us, we have allowed the systems that they perpetuate to make things difficult for the folks that historically have never been able to uh, to get any further than they are. So with that, I'm going to stop talking and thank uh, Root Cause Research again for allowing me to participate today. Thank you. Thank you so much, Martina. That was great. Next, uh, the next person that's coming up, we have had the real, a real pleasure to organize with over the past year, and I want to personally thank them for their men mentorship and their commitment to principles around organizing, and I'd like to introduce Talisha Wilson with the No LMPD campaign. Hey, everybody. Yes, Tala or Talisha, she, her, hers. I am a community uh, organizer and activist and um Nonprofit, um, all things community led is what I am involved in. Um, I'm really selling. I'm really selling myself short right right here right now because I don't want to take up too much space with that. Um, you want to learn more about what I do personally and kind of the work that I do? Just visit talishawilson.com. Um, let's talk a little bit about the No LMPD campaign. So we started this campaign. Um, with the idea of defunding LMPD, right? Um, but how do you do that? Um, how do we make that happen? What has to go into that, right? There's this whole entire process um, that is very much um, I don't understand as well as I would like to. And um, that lets me know that a lot of other people may not understand either. Um, but there's all of these steps that we have to take before we can even get to a conversation of defund, right? get to a conversation where those there are actionable items that happen to actually defund LMPD. Um, before you defund LMPD you, LMPD, you need to know what is happening with LMPD. So we started this campaign, me alongside uh, RCRC and um, some other people in the community. Uh, we created the No LMPD campaign to learn about who is LMPD? What do they do? Why are we asking for them to be defunded? Why are we asking for them to uh, be accountable, right? Um, and so we started with the help of some council people, 
um, started the separating the budget campaign. Right now, the little the city budget is addressed as a whole, and so within the budget committee of the Metro Council members, the budget committee, they address everything separately in line by line. But when it is taken to the rest of the council members, um, it is addressed as a whole city budget, which means that if you defund or take away money from LNPD, you're also taking away money from libraries, from um, housing, from uh, parks and recreation, from public health, all the essential needs, all the essential things that we need. And so by separating the budget, LNPD's budget from the rest of the city's budget, we're able to address that as its own separate entity and give it the scrutiny that it deserves without holding back these other essential departments from getting the resources that they need. Is that making sense to everybody? Um, and so we are calling on Bill Hollander, who is the chair of the budget committee. We are asking him, we are asking him to bring separating the budget to the budget committee so that it can be separated and then remain separated after um, it goes to the full council. Um, and the way that you can support that is by signing our petition, which outlines all of what I said in more detail. And you can also send a letter to Bill Hollander. We'll have more information coming out about that in the next few days. Um, and then you can organize with us, come to the table with us, because something that I think is unique about our campaign is that we're learning together. None of us know all of the information and we're all learning as time uh, as time progresses. And that's something that I absolutely think is essential to any type of abolition work, any type of movement work, any type of organizing work. So if you would like to learn more about No LMPD, you can visit our IG page, which is No LMPD. And what we mean by no is it is no as in no who LMPD is, no where their money is going, no how much um know the, the 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 number of liabilities uh the amount of money and liabilities that has that has they have had to pay out know everything about them so that we can know how to um defund them how to abolish them right because i am an abolitionist so my goal my personal goal is to like get rid of it all right um but know who LMPD is, but also know LMPD because no policing, because what we know is that policing um, does not do anything besides harm marginalized people in communities, specifically black communities, specifically um, poor communities. Right. And so no LMPD, K, capital N, O lowercase w lmpd on all social media and yeah and if you want to learn more about the campaign specifically we definitely invite you to the table any questions no questions i like questions so if you have them i definitely um want to answer what i can and thank you everybody Thank you, Tala. That was dope. Yes. Well, I have to leave y'all. I hope the rest of this goes uh, great. I have to leave you all because I have some prior arrangements. But yes, again, I'm just going to reiterate this because I know that sometimes it is really difficult to, to know all the ins and outs of policy and legislation and in and, and political language and lingo. It's all confusing to me as well. And so again, if you're someone who's like, I really don't know about this. Please sit at the table with us because we don't know either and we trying to figure it out too, right? And let's figure it out together and hopefully with all of our brain power and all of our creativity and all of our different ideas being at the table, we come up with something, even if it's all different, some type of shared value or shared understanding so that we can all grow and learn together while still fighting the system, right? Okay, that's all I have. Thank y'all so much. Thank you, Tala. No and, problem. And moving along, uh, we were really uh, thrilled that uh, we got to organize this year. We just started organizing for real alongside uh, the PSL chapter of Louisville, who I believe just 
got a chaptership established. And so they are here today represented by Greg Capillo. Hey y'all, I know we've been going long, so I won't be super, super long. Um, but yeah, so um, we uh, have a full chapter in Louisville. Um, uh, and we are a Marxist-Leninist party um, who just really looks at the landscape of what's happening right now and doesn't see any um, real voice for working people um, or a multinational party. Um, um, and so, um, yeah, we don't really see, you know, really a, a uh, we see that working people um, of um, all uh, races and, and demographics are excluded from the process. And so the project we see in front of us is building power for working class people by organizing direct action. Um, um, specifically, we're you know par partnering with Root Cause to help them in their tenant organizing. Um, my day job outside of um, being a communist is, um, uh, um, working it with unhoused folks, um, um, at a homeless shelter doing housing navigation. And I think, um, one of the really key takeaways from that and from also from our organizing work is that, you know, we have this, um, desperate need to only view housing as a commodity and only view it in the way that it can generate a profit for someone and really it needs to be regarded as a national as a you know uh a need um as a social need um and so um the other like major problem is that um they're just there's not landlords have all of the power you know um you read these giant nonprofit reports where people like scratch their head about um about um fair housing and and lack of, and, and 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 you know um uh impediment access or access or, uh impediments to access and all this stuff but then you know nobody really like talks about um um you know like enforcing the law against landlords <laughs> Um, and that's to us what that means is that that's a question of power uh, and the only way that, that um, gets rectified is through organizing um, so um, I'm really uh, just super glad that I'm able to um, leave work and work with uh, um, you know uh, Josh and Root Cause um, because um, yeah, we're not doing anything to fundamentally, um, you know, um, put put some put something on the other scale of that. Um, um, yeah, there, there, there just won't be any kind of meaningful change. Um, so um, you can find out more about uh, the party at um, PSLweb.org. Um, and um, if you have any questions, um, I'm happy to answer them. Just you know. Um, uh, feel free to message Josh or Jessica and get my contact information. I'd love to talk to anybody who's um, interested more about what we do. Thanks for having us. Thank you so much, Greg. Love you all. And we're moving right along. Uh, the next folks we're going to introduce are some really dope lawyers that work here in Louisville. We don't always uh, get to work with lawyers. We hear the term movement lawyer a lot, but I don't know that we see really good examples of it. However, this next um, next this next law firm is a good example of what movement lawyering is, and they are here today represented by Kelly Perry Johnson. Hi there. Thank you so much for having us today. I'm just completely in awe of the work that all of these organizers and activists are doing. Um, I am one of the partners with uh, Reese Syed Perry Johnson. There's only three of us. It's myself, Jeremiah Reese, and Soha Syed, but they couldn't be here today, unfortunately. Um, we were founded in 2020, in fall of 2020, with the idea that lawyers should and can be pursuing work that supports abolitionist principles. And so we aim to perform legal work that is actively anti-racist, anti-fascist, anti-capitalist. 
The primary bulk of the legal work that we do is actually for plaintiff's employment discrimination. So we re primarily represent employees in all types of discrimination suits, such as sexual harassment, race discrimination, sexual orientation discrimination, um, trans discrimination. We also do um, wage theft against employers or retaliation claims. Um, disability discrimination, anything that kind of falls under that umbrella. We absolutely, under no circumstances, represent businesses or companies. We also do civil rights work, and that's, you know, I think kind of what you would expect it to be as far as police brutality cases or issues um, over with incarceration, um, things that have happened to incarcerated people. Um, what brings us here today and what's connected us to Root Cause Research Center is actually um, that we want to do work behind the scenes, to, um, legal work to support activists and organizers. So specifically, we connected with Root Cause um, regarding the West End TIF, and we are working to provide pro bono legal work to the incredible and courageous work that all of the local organizers are doing to stop the West End TIF. Um, that's something we are definitely interested in pursuing, and if you're your organization thinks they need some behind the scenes legal work. If it's something that we can do, um, something we have the resources for and aligns, we are absolutely happy to talk with you. I'll drop our firm info, the website and the email in the chat. Um, thank you again so much for having us. I'm just completely honored to be here amongst all of you. And if there's anything we can do to help, please don't hesitate to reach out. Thank you so much, Kelly. Love you all. Um, the next person that's going to join us is, uh, well, before we introduce them, I just want to say personally that uh, a lot of you all know me and know that I am from um, Eastern Kentucky. I'm from Robertson County in Eastern Kentucky. I have been away from Eastern Kentucky for a long time and here in Louisville and been working here in Louisville, but I always try to find my way back, a way, a way to go back and organize where I'm from. And this year, uh, last year, really, we, uh, we worked with the Rowan County Listening Project and Michael Harrington, uh, and it became um, a labor of love and the relationships that we built out of that, I think I will have the rest of my life. So without further ado, I will introduce Michael Harrington from the Rowan County Listening Project. Thank you, Michael. Thanks, everybody. Thanks for having me. My name is Michael Harrington. I use he, him pronouns. And as Josh said, I'm with the Rowan County Listening Project. Um, we are everyday workers and tenants in northeastern Kentucky. We especially work alongside trailer park residents who are catching hell from landlords and local public officials. Um, we build shared power among all of us who are facing down the barrel of displacement that's caused by the ruling class and their so-called economic development projects. We build tenant power amid the increasingly consolidated um, of corporate ownership of mobile home parks. We knock on doors to invite working families and tenants to get involved, to take action for our futures and seize the power that's rightfully ours and is already in our hands, in our neighborhoods, and in our relationships. We build on that power that's already there and work together to organize it. That means we reject and oppose the racist lies and tricks of the ruling class that want us, and especially people like me and who look like me, to point the finger at our black and brown immigrant women and LGBTQ neighbors. We know that the finger must always point at the root cause of our suffering. That's the ruling class power structure that eats and breathes and spreads white supremacy and division. That's how it runs. Um, we do this work because our lives depend on it and we have a whole new world to win. Um, and winning that requires action. So that's what we do. Um, I wanna briefly, um, share um, some of the work that we've been able to do this past year um, with the support um, and, and coalition partners with the Root Cause Research Center. In March, so about one year ago, um, 2021, um, 
a Lexington-based developer named Patrick Madden in collusion with the city of Moorhead and the Rowan County Fiscal Court worked together to establish a tax increment financing district in, that covered an entire trailer park in Rowan County, Kentucky. Um, you've heard a lot about TIFFs um, on this call. Um, and they can feel like a really inaccessible topic for everyday residents and tenants. Um, that's actually by design and on purpose. TIFFs are not that complicated to understand. We're just kept from and, and understanding them is hidden from us because the ruling class don't want us to know what they actually are, how they actually function and how they're being used. What they are are glorified tax schemes that the ruling class um, and their partners in, in local governments and state governments use to steal the homes of poor tenants. That's it. Um, steal the homes and steal the neighborhoods of poor tenants and use luxury tax incentives so that wealthy people can make a whole lot of money from stealing. Um, so um, that happened in northeastern Kentucky, um, a trailer park that had 75 units of affordable housing was targeted by rich developers and their partners in local governments to bulldoze it over and pave the way to put up an unneeded and unnecessary strip mall. The promise was that the developer was going to bring jobs. Um, so that um, he needed that land and it no longer needed to be used to house um, many affordable housing units. So the residents were told without um, warning and a ton of misinformation to get the hell out of Dodge because the bulldozers are coming. Um, so where do you go when something like that happens um, to your neighborhood? There's no affordable housing left anywhere um, in Rowan County. Um, tenants from the, from the mobile home park were used to paying $125 a month in lot rent. Um, small apartments in Rowan County um, can cost you $900 a month um, for rent. Um, that's a far cry from $125. The slate um, and fleet of affordable housing um, is shrinking due to these root causes that we've mentioned before. Um, and so I just kind of want to bring in a voice of one of the tenants, Mindy Davenport, who is um, a former resident of the North Fork Mobile Home Park. We were able to do a lot of research because Root Cause Research Cen Center supported us and said, you all have everything that you need to understand these TIFFs. Um, they're, not, they're not complicated because you're not smart um, or anything like that. It's hidden from you on purpose. So Josh is gonna share screen um, so that we can bring in a voice of one of the residents reflecting on the research that she did pouring through this, um, this TIFF language document. Um, so give us just one second as we pull that up. Um, Mindy from Eastern Kentucky and Round County says, um, this is the dynamic that's happening. Who is pursuing these TIFFs and who are being targeted by these TIFFs? Um, we, meaning the tenants of North Fork, have always worked. Those people, public officials and developers, have never worked for what they have. Our mayor has never dug a ditch, cleaned a house, cleaned a toilet, or whatever for minimum wage to raise her kids. She had her money handed to her, but I've worked three jobs for years and years and years to raise my kid and they call me the blight? No, I'm not the blight, they're the blight. Um, over the course of this campaign, we learned that um, being called a blight um, not only is very, very painful, um, very painful experience to go through, but that it's also used strategically by developers and public officials to target neighborhoods in order to wipe them out, to make the way for development projects or other schemes that target those neighborhoods. Um, 
so I, like I said, we worked on this campaign um, with deep, deep solidarity and support um, with our, our partners at the Root Cause Research Center um, and others. And I just wanna briefly share, because I know we're getting close to time, some of the organizing lessons that we learned over the past year and lessons that we're going to apply as we continue our work for 2022. Um, the first thing is when a neighborhood is facing a really hard time, organized power makes all the difference. But how do you build organized power when there's just tears on tears on tears because what you're going through is really hard? Um, that's the reality, right? This work is, is hard to do and you're trying to do it amid some of the most trying times of your life. So what we would do is we would rely heavily on music and on art. Every time we would have an organizing meeting to plan our next steps, every time we would have a barbecue and a cookout just to lift our spirits up amid some really tough times, we would sing songs together. Um, Ashley Woodard Henderson, um, a co-director of the Highlander and Research and Education Center in East Tennessee, um, reminds us that the reason that we sing together is because it actually helps us win together. Um, we breathe and we sing together because it helps us build revolutionary struggle together. And we're not going to be able to win that struggle if we're not able to sing together. Um, so we pulled in so much life and spirit affirming song and art. want to share, um, you know, when times are hard, you can be very creative to, to put your voice um, and use your voice in a way um, by expressing your creativity. So we had tons of folks creating art, um, protest signs, chants, um, all of that kind of creative energy helped sustain us while we were trying to do the work and while we were taking direct action. And it's meant a lot to us to kind of keep our spirits whole um, as we went throughout the entirety of last year. Um, another thing that we learned is about what is it like for everyday folks to work so closely with the press, right? Tons of giant press outlets and stuff wanted to, to hear stories. Um, and it's actually incredibly rare for Eastern Kentuckians and uh, just like as many other folks um, to be able to share our stories in a way that give us dignity, right? Stories are told about Eastern Kentuckians, but we're rarely ever past the mic to tell our own stories in our own ways, owning those stories in a way that gives us our dignity. We know that we're dignified. We know that we have that. Um, we're denied the opportunity to have the mic in order to claim it. Um, so we, we use the press to spotlight a lot of our direct actions targeting the developer, Patrick Madden, as well as local public officials. Um, and when we had that mic, we insisted that we used it in a way that, that displayed our power and our dignity. And it made us stronger because of that. Um, another thing that we learned is you, you reach for many tools that are in your toolbox. One tool that we reach for is suing the city of Moorhead. We filed a lawsuit um, against the city of Moorhead for their role um, in um, paving the way for the tax incentives that led to stealing homes and stealing a neighborhood. Um, we are um, appealing um, rulings in court. We'll fight that out in court along the way. But I wanna emphasize that winning these things is not a function of winning them in court. You use them as a tool what determines whether you win or lose is not what a judge says. Judges have no power over you. The question that determines whether you win or lose is, do you build organizing power, independent power? So that's what we're doing while the court case is making its way through. Um, and judges and, and attorneys are talking about those things. It's very important. We're glad that that work is happening. None of that has diverted us from building together organized power of tenants. Um, I also want <clears throat> to say something that for me that I learned I've been organizing for a while and, and sometimes it's been hard for me to see the value in, in certain practices right um, to, to keep an organizing group together for the long haul 
um, this past year was really kind of a come to come to Jesus moment for me where I had to learn that healing circles, um, supportive practices, being in a space together to give each other hugs, just sitting there and listening to each other while we cry and having those spaces for healing. That's the only way that we can sustain ourselves in order to do this. And it's actually a vital part of organizing. So we create organizing meetings and spaces that have deep practices of mutual support and healing within them because there wasn't any other way that we could do the work that we did last year without them um, and then finally i, I just want to say over the course of taking on a developer and taking on local public officials and their power, we realized that we were building power too um, and taking direct actions, right? Um, but you, it's important to remember in the middle of a campaign that you don't build power in order to sit on it and just have it. You build power in order to exercise power, um, right? So as you grow in your strength, as you grow in your numbers, you have to flex um, and, and put that power that you've built into motion and into action. So you consistently take actions um, that increase your power along the way. Don't build power to sit on it, build power to exercise it. Um, then finally, I'll just kind of want to leave you with um, the reason that we do the work that we do with the Rowan County Listening Project is to build a base of working people, um, a strong base of growing numbers of people that have everything to win and nothing to lose. Um, and these, what I've described on taking the things that we did to take on developers, these are the kinds of things that you can do when you build a powerful base that the ruling class can't resist. Um, so at Round County Listening Project, we believe like what Mary Marcy, an industrial workers of the world organizer said in 1911, that we learn to fight by fighting. Um, we know that the Root Cause Research Center moves in that way too, um, which is why we look forward to growing together um, a deepening relationship over the course of the next year, and we're honored to be here. Um, you can check out the Round County Listening Project on Facebook, Round County Listening Project, and on Instagram, Round County Listening Project. Pleasure to be here. I want to take a moment to really thank every single person who presented, every partner, every individual who, who's, who's here that, that is a part of the fight, that is pushed back. Um, thank you. Is that every time we have these moments where, uh, where we're talking about not only the work, but we're building a memory of struggle, as well as a memory of that resistance. And without that memory, how are we supposed to continue to expand our possibilities? Especially with all the turmoil that goes on in the world, all the things that we have to hold from time to time. We forget so much of what this work is and, and what, what it can mean when we all collectively work together, building this power. I just wanna thank y'all. And I feel just not only so rallied, you know, and rejuvenated spirit, refreshed, <laughs> uh, but just incredibly honored. To, to, to work with y'all, to know you, to, to be able to hear these words today. It's thank you. Just wanna take a moment to say thank you. And now I have the privilege of also introducing our featured cohort, the 2021 Community Researchers. So as I said earlier, this is, this is nine months in the making. Uh, but these projects are just the tip of the iceberg. Uh, the, the two projects that came out of this are part of ongoing series. Uh, one has more than one content that we'll share online next week, as well as we'll share that through email. We'll be playing one of those episodes today. And the other one, we have a, a great segment to show you. And again, it's just the beginning of greater things, more things growing on this research. So I'm gonna go ahead and pull up my PowerPoint and share screen. All right. All right. So, yeah, 
So we'll be sharing out the content uh, next week, the links, but for folks who are attending or viewing this live, uh, you are going to be the first people to experience this. You get first view, and we're excited to share this moment with you. First up, there's Joyne Woodard. She is a brilliant researcher, media maker, and mother of three. Inspired to expose truths hidden from the Black community, she first began experimenting with data in a cohort that examined and investigated ties between foreclosure data, land bank data, and data features of economic mobility for the West Louisville area. Her studies and passion for research activism led her to apply for the Community Research Incubator, where she partnered with Woody Pryor to create Out of the Woods. It's a podcast. Out of the Woods is a podcast series that investigates the role of academia in propping up and protecting policing in Louisville, Kentucky. Up next is Woody Pryor. Woody Pryor is a working class scholar, musician, and loving brother, husband, and father of three beautiful sons. His family is the joy of his life. He is passionate about the Black community and centers reparations as a theory of change in his scholarship. As a two-time community researcher at the Root Cause Research Center, he has produced work that has addressed the myths within the racial wealth gap, as well as this podcast series, Out of the Woods, which again is a series that, is, that was created by both Woody and Joyne Woodard, and the series investigates the role of academia in propping up and protecting policing. Without further ado, I'm going to play Out of the Woods, episode two. Did my folder close? Hold on. Let's pull up that folder. Got it. Let me share screen. You are now listening to Out of the Woods, where we invite you to step out of the darkness and into the light. series will be focusing on how police data is used and how it is in the end destroying communities. So basically, we have been going through all of this information to get down to one of the major key players in the city of Louisville, who is playing both sides. Not only are they on the side of the police to produce data, but she is also on the side of academics with the production of studies that is taken from this data. She needs no introduction. She is highly networked. She has influence within local, statewide, national, and international law enforcement. She continues to impact our communities with her incredulous States. Deborah Keeley is a professor and associate dean in UofL's Justice Administration Department, and she's working on those studies and has been for a few years now. Deb, good to see you. Nice to see you, Mark. This was back in, what, 20, 2017 with UofL Today? It's UofL Today on 93.9 The Bill. Here's your host, Mark Hebert. In the beginning, the guy gives the introduction about how UofL does a lot of research for LMPD. 
Uh, so the local police department has contracted with the University of Louisville, specifically you, uh, to do some studies for them. What are these studies that you're working on for the LMPD and the city of Louisville? Well, I work on two sets of studies. Uh, one is a citizen's attitude survey. It's an assessment of how, basically how citizens in Louisville feel about the quality of police services as they are delivered in their neighborhoods. And then secondly, I analyze vehicle stops data to assess the potential for biased policing. Okay, well, let's talk about the survey of citizens first off. What, what was the survey? How many folks did you survey and what did you find? Okay, well, first of all, this is, I would mention that, that citizens' attitude surveys are like a standard instrument these days in law enforcement. It's a management tool so that they can adjust their services if necessary. Um, we surveyed, it's a phone survey. We surveyed 2,400 individuals, random phone calls to landlines, cell lines, the time frame in between where they were calling was in the afternoon. Majority of the people that are home during those times are older people. We already know majority of the people who, who answered their phones, um, older, older white women. That's basically who, who did the interview. And middle class people do have more free time than those who work and then have to come home and get their house together with their children, you know, come home and make dinner. Regular working class people don't have time to constantly be answering the phone for a silly survey. And then what she failed to even mention is that there was certain stuff that they would stop the survey and be like, oh, you're not a good candidate for it. So she didn't even mention that even in her radio interview. Um, we, we like to have an equal number of representatives from each dis division, so we collect 300 responses from each division. How many divisions are there? There are eight divisions, okay. and, and the, reason that we, the reason that we try to get an equal number of responses from each division is that the divisions have differing numbers of individuals in that division, and we didn't want the more populated divisions to have more input into the survey than those that were less populated. So. So she called 300 people from each area because she didn't want to have a bias for more populated areas, which that automatically creates a bias. She knows statistics, so she should have had it broken down to more people coming from the more populated areas. Because, of course, you have like people out in the suburbs. Come on. They are going to talk very highly of the police and, of course, have a, a, a sense of security and safety because they're not the ones being harassed. They probably have police in their family and things like that. So they're, they are going to talk very highly of the police. So the survey of the local police, of the attitudes towards the local police, you found what? Actually, we find what we have found consistently since 2012 and, and uh, what we found when I did it under our prior uh, police chief in 2005, 6, and 7 is that public's attitudes towards police services in our community are very positive. Are you surprised? Um, well, you know, I, I've, I've been surprised that there hasn't been a change since 2012, you know, because of Ferguson and all of the incidents that have happened uh, across the United States and, and also because of all of the media attention to the homicide rate in Louisville. And so what we found is that is that the citizens are still consistently positive. So. I mean, it seems to me that our police are doing something right. Uh, apparently. Um, <laughs> well, because uh, one of the numbers that uh, you sent me, that, uh, or that was in the survey, 53% of the folks surveyed were very satisfied, 37% somewhat satisfied with police services. So that's 90% exactly. of the people in Metro Louisville are basically happy with the police services. Exactly. And and so one of the problems is if, is if I try to analyze, like, why people are unhappy. I don't have enough respondents to really get a good statistic. Only 10% of them are yeah. unhappy. You know, so um, yeah, and, and I used to call, there are a series of questions about specifically how are the police doing in terms of crime prevention, helping victims, um, keeping order on the streets, help being helpful to citizens and being fair to citizens. And, and, and these, are, these are so high that there's no variability. I mean, 95% mm -hmm. believe that the police are fair to citizens and 90% um, believe that they're keeping good order on the streets, so. Okay, uh, we're talking with Deborah Keeling who's a professor and associate dean in the uh, College of Arts and Sciences and Justice Administration Department at UofL. And she's done some work for the police department surveying local citizens in a couple different areas.
for me for the study to stay the same. If I mean, yeah. it's, it's absolutely nothing. Yeah. The study stays the same, but yet black drivers in Louisville are 60% more likely to be stopped compared to white drivers. Black motorists were searched 12% of the time compared with the 4% of the time of white drivers. Data shows that police found contraband in 70% of their searches of whites versus only 41 for African-Americans. But from 2010 to 2019, Black residents make up nearly 21% of Louisville's population, but involve almost 50% of the use of force and incidents. Like, I mean, come on. But everybody's happy, though except for this small percent. But then when you look at the makeup of the small percent, what do, you know, what are we, what are we doing? And then also she goes on to say that African-Americans are more critical of the police and police presence. But yeah, because even with her talking about Ferguson and things like that, I can go back to the early 2000s where the police was still like killing people here in, in Kentucky. Picture it, the year is 1999, the city is Louisville. Everybody is in an uproar. The city three years prior had already secured grant money to, to finally destroy Louisville's public housing complexes. The whole city is worried. Where would they put these people? And if they would fall into their neighborhoods and what type of chaos and crime they would bring. Meanwhile, residents of these complexes are distraught and are in despair for their uncertain future. Will they be able to return? Where will they go until then? Would they be able to even move into other housing complexes? Where would their children attend school? Or even if they had the necessary resources to move? June, 1999, oh no, shots fired. 22 bullets rang out, nine of which strike Desmond Rudolph, leaving him lingering in misery for days. Officially charged and case dismissed because the defendant is deceased. Listen to this segment from New York Times released in 2014. He tell me at age, 12. He said, I know I'm having my die, and I'm not scared to die. I said, Desmond, how are you going to die? He said, the police going to kill me. Sherry Rudolph's son, Desmond, started stealing cars when he was in middle school. In May of 1999, the 18-year-old was fleeing from police in a stolen truck through this West End alley. Although he was unarmed, Two police officers fired 22 rounds at him in self-defense, they said. The day he died, they charged him with attempt murder. And then they said, this is dismissed. <laughs> a few months later, when a grand jury decided not to indict the officers, the city remained calm. But the following March, the police department awarded medals of honor to the two officers for their conduct during the incident. To add insult to injury, the police chief a year later awards those same officers service awards for the way they handled the situation. In response to the outcry, the mayor fired the police chief. Hundreds of police officers flooded the streets to protest the firing. Tensions rose between the predominantly white police force and the black community in the West End. The police chief is fired and then replaced with Robert White, which for me was just another black face for a still corrupt department. Black residents also took to the streets in protest. 2004, shots are fired again. This time, three shots in the back that killed Michael Newby, an unarmed team whom all witnesses stated he was trying to flee police in an alleged drug investigation. Bam, the gavel sounds. The officer is acquitted on all charges. From murder to acquittal in just eight short months, this is just two of the seven people that were killed by LMPD during this time frame. Not only after this, tensions between police and the Black community only continue to get worse. When the president of the Louisville Fraternal Order of Police, Dave Mutchler, puts Louisville citizens on notice when he publicly released a threatening letter to those speaking out against police brutality. <laughs> Head of the union representing Louisville's police officers is standing behind the words that he wrote, which have caused some to call for him to step down. Dave Mutchler wrote the open letter in response to the community's reaction to a deadly officer-involved shooting. 
An eight-paragraph letter written by River City FOP President Dave Mutchler has some people extremely upset. In the letter, Mutchler wrote, quote, to the sensationalists, race baiters, and liars, we are done with you. He went on to say, if your behavior or untruths causes harm to us or the public, we will make every attempt to have you investigated, charged, and prosecuted at the local, state, or federal level. Our goal is for the criminal element to say to themselves, it would be much easier for us to go somewhere else and commit crimes. Uh, and when that happens, then Louisville becomes a safer community. So the survey of the local police, of the attitudes towards the local police, you found what? Actually, we find what we have found consistently since 2012 and, and uh, what we found when I did it under our prior uh, police chief in 2005, six and seven is that Public's attitudes towards police services in our community are very positive. Between the police claiming more black bodies, protest against police brutality, threats from LMPD, sexual allegations in the Explorer program, to have Deborah Keeling, a University of Louisville professor, director of their Justice Department, and who sits on the board of the Southern Police Institute, whom I might add trains and educates police officers all over the North and South. Do a survey on how satisfied Louisvillians are with LMPD and have a 95% satisfaction. It's just a botched recon mission, a cover-up, academic gaslighting, academic complicity with white supremacy to squander and erase experiences of poor and working class Black people by those who swore to protect and serve and uphold truth and justice. Her work erases their reality. She chose to ignore a lot of evidence in her methodology. A report that when you try to find it, all links are broken. But before the link could be broken, the survey itself was broken from the beginning. You are listening to Out of the Woods, where we invite you to step out of the darkness and into the light. All right. So that was episode two. Oh, episode two of Out of the Woods. We'll be sharing links to both episode one and episode two on the website, as well as uh, via email to folks who registered for this event. The folks who are attending, we have your email and we'll make sure you get them. Um, this content is hot. <laughs> yes. Next up. We have Mariel Gardner. Mariel Gardner is an urban farmer at Fifth Element Farms, AKA Apocalyptic Acres. And she is a passionate scholar. As a researcher, she is most interested in black land dispossession and its connection to the history of racial violence in Kentucky. She is also both a fierce and charming community organizer with the Historically Black Neighborhood Assembly. She is powerful force. Through her work with the Community Research Incubator and upcoming fellowship with RCRC, she has begun to outline and produce a large body of knowledge in new and creative ways. We'll pull it up. For some reason, I keep closing this dang folder. You don't know how that works. That happens. There it is. Wonderful. Pull it up. All right, hold on to your seats. Help us, Malia Ayana. You're our only hope. Eight generations and 132 years ago, 
the fifth element was introduced to your great, 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 great grandmothers, Judith Casey and Flora Major on the evening after their children, Tom and Julia Wed. A storm furious and eager with ruin called across Christian County. Its numerous lightning strikes disfigured fields from Pembroke to St. Elmo, Lafayette to Hopkinsville. While surveying the Lafayette farm owned by Tom for damages, Judith and Flora find a tree alive with electricity guarded by Elohim, the Ananuki ambassador. No taller than a wagon wheel, their pale green skin was haloed by a shimmering yellow glow. Elohim's hands were plentiful, an additional two sets jutting out of their torso and hips. Three red almond-shaped eyes settled on Flora and Judith, relaxing their battle-like stance. Elohim explained, be not afraid. I am Elohim of the Ananuki Freedom Colony. Lana White, destroyer of species, cultivator of despair, returned to Earth disguised as lightning, bringing another legion of her speculators, intent on continuing her reign of terror. Physically, they appear to be human, cloaking themselves in whiteness to infiltrate and assume trustworthy positions in your society. She extracts resources above and beneath your soil, rapidly weakening your planet's vitality. The gas is produced by your planet as it dies, maintain her life force, and she uses what you value most to speed the disease. Earth's humans have based their entire social order on whiteness and wealth, using land and labor to bolster both. White and the speculators are skilled hypnotists with the ability to consign memories to oblivion, making it easier to reshape history and maintain power. The only way to defeat her is for your memories to advance through time so your descendants can recognize her tactics and expose her evil strategy. This piece of the fifth element will allow you to enter the dreams of those in your bloodline. Tell them your stories and when they are ready, they will free themselves. But be warned, the fifth element is one resource which Lina must never possess. Its power in her hands will imprison planets and galaxies beyond this plane and none of us can prepare for the bevy of pain Lana White will force upon us if she controls the fifth element. While Earth is a nurturing home for her and the speculators, the Ananuki find it difficult to survive here. Your atmosphere diminishes our strength. We cannot stay long, but we will return often. Flora and Judith first visited my brother Milton and I after the death of our great-grandfather James Jones, who was the husband of Judith and Flora's great-granddaughter Rosetta. Upon his passing, we received an inscribed box containing two spherical triangles made of crystal, each laced between a worn piece of twine. That night, we both dreamed of Kentucky just after the Civil War. Over time, the dreams became so recurrent, we could recite the story by heart. Eighteen seventy one started with violence when a mob of 17 white men from the Henry and Shelby County Ku Klux chapters armed with double barrel shotguns terrorized the black population of Stamping Ground and Watkinsville in Scott County. Unable to find William Blackburn at his barbershop in Stamping Ground, they continued their bloodthirsty spree until they encountered Cupid, an elderly shoemaker, and murdered him in his home. Undeterred, they continued their march to Watkinsville, where they are met with force. Black neighbors fight back, kill one of the aggressors, and the invaders eventually retreat. Unsure of when the Klan might return, they leave their homes and seek asylum in Frankfurt, just as the Kentucky General Assembly is introducing a Ku Klux bill. Kentucky and the rest of the Southern states are experiencing numerous acts of terrorism at the hands of groups of masked men who are just impossible to identify, despite Black folks pointing fingers and naming names. There are two proposals for the bill. 
Senator Chenoweth's version would use a $500,000 budget to create a governor-appointed task force to root out offenders and prosecute them in accordance with state law. Senator Spalding's version adds more detail about premeditation and assigns mandatory penalties for offenders and accomplices ranging from fines and jail time to death. Spalding's task force budget is $25,000, and the legislature fights over the budget amount, eventually reducing it to $10,000. All the while, Governor Stevenson is preparing to resign, not in protest because the legislature can't get it together enough to protect the lives of the laborers who created their fortunes, but to become a U.S. Senator and further the Bourbon Democrat agenda on reconstruction, which resolved that states should be able to decide their own approach to building back better after the Civil War. It's an old song. When it comes to Black people, states' rights ain't where it's at nor where it's ever been. Bourbon Democrats are opposed by radical Republicans. Radicals are abolitionists prior to the war with a sprinkle of socialism and don't believe ex-Confederates should assume positions in the post-war government. The Kentucky General Assembly fails to pass the Ku Klux Klan bill during this session, probably because members of the Klan are elected to the House and Senate. Like, what kind of police do you call on the police? Who watches the watchmen? They do, however, pass legislation permitting us to testify in court, which could prove helpful in prosecuting Klan members. But Malia, you know it won't. <laughs> Later in January, William Gibson became the mail agent for the Louisville, Frankfurt, and Lexington mail route. Previously, he worked the Lebanon route, becoming the first Black mail agent in the Commonwealth. By the second trip on his new route, the Klan attacked him at North Benson train station in Franklin County and threatened that if he didn't resign, he would be dealt with. Gibson takes a few days off and upon returning to work is provided with 10 U.S. Marshals for protection. Now word on the street is that the Klan can easily overtake Gibson's guard as their numbers greatly exceed the Marshals. Mail continues to run without incident until March 3rd when the Postmaster General suspends the service. And I'm telling you, people are bothered. Folks want their mail quickly. Stagecoach delivery is much slower than the train delivery and blame for the inconvenience is hurled everywhere. The issue becomes super political. Democrats blame Republican President Grant for influencing the Postmaster General to shut the mail service down. And Grant is like, these fools are interfering with mail all over the South. Y'all ain't trying to stop them because you're sipping too much bourbon and don't think the Klan is a problem. So I'm going to do what I got to do. Kentucky becomes one of the children for the forthcoming federal Ku Klux Klan bill to protect us from white domestic terrorists retaliating for losing the Civil War, their land, and wealth. The previously unpaid workforce now demands compensation, lowering profits. And many Confederates are driven out of the South during and after the war, leaving their acreage behind. I do declare the Southern way of life is changing. The white elite class is bitter and uses the Klan to regulate with vigilante violence. Governor, now Senator Stevenson, a Confederate sympathizer who doesn't even fight in the war, goes before the U.S. Senate saying Mr. Gibson was unqualified for the position. A white man should have been hired. And the story of the Ku Klux attacking Gibson was an exaggeration. He assures the chamber that when the facts come out, a Republican will be responsible and the entire ordeal will boil down to political trickery because the Klan doesn't even exist in Kentucky. Senator Sherman from Ohio shuts Stevenson down like his name is Rand Paul, citing an incident where the Ku Klux break a man out of jail who had been in prison for killing a Black man in Frankfurt while Stevenson is governor. Senator Sherman should have also mentioned the attack on February 20th of former male agent, Civil War veteran, and Blacksmith Darius Faulkner. Faulkner owned his home in Estill County and hosted Reverend Anderson Crawford from Berea College there. 
Berea in neighboring Madison County is continuing to create a racially mixed community by diversifying the college's ministry, academic programs, and living quarters. Reverend Crawford, while out checking on his horse, is met with gunfire. He retreats back into the home where Faulkner and William Johnson begin to fire back at their assailants. David Athey, who Faulkner once believed to be a friend and radical, along with Granville Caddy, are arrested for the crime. Faulkner testifies at the trial, but the men are still acquitted. Berea is an abolitionist college, and these folks are traveling the state recruiting Blacks to attend the school, and the Estill County Klan, they ain't about that life. Racial mixing is a good way to build power, but it's a dangerous prospect for affluent power holders. The Ku Klux attack Mr. Adams, a white man for living in a home with Blacks and for suggesting he'd rather his sister marry a Black person than a rebel. Thomas Gilbert, a leader of the Klan, organizes 40 men to send a message to Mr. Adams. They wrestle that man out of his bed in the middle of the night and pistol whip him. The revolver accidentally discharges, injuring one of the Klansmen. But when they get Mr. Adams outside, each of the men take turns whipping him, and he receives 82 lashes from whips made from surrounding tree branches. There seems to be no reprieve for us or our comrades. So Black Kentuckians from the hood to the holler petition the state and federal legislatures for policy-driven protections by detailing 199 episodes of racial violence in the Commonwealth. On April 20th, 1871, President Grant signed the Ku Klux Klan Act protecting the civil and political liberties guaranteed to us by the 14th Amendment. Nevertheless, the Klan persists, forcibly recruiting men to join their brigade. Notices are sent to white folks giving them the options to leave the county, join up, or catch hands. Women are, women are not absolved. Mrs. Woodward, a white woman who spoke out against the Powell County group, was taken to the woods and beaten. And Thomas Payne, a white Knox County native, received notices from the Klan at his job in the mines of Fitchburg. The written threats continue for months and start showing up at his home, so he leaves for two months. When he returns, the threats start again, and some nights later, he overhears Klan leader Thomas Gilbert order 10 men to surround and search his home. Payne escapes, and the next day confronts Gilbert. And Gilbert's like, nah, bro, it wasn't me. Four times, word reaches Payne that the Klan will give him one last chance. He can join them or leave Estill County. He decides to join up and act as an informant to get back at the band for the terror they've imposed upon him. Once initiated into the band of sycophants, Payne learns that Estill County is infested with Klan activity. There are companies in Cobb Mountain, Fitchburg, Scott's Landing, Hardrick's Creek, the Estill Furnace, and at each locality throughout the county. He discovers State Senator Harrison Cockrell is the head and front of the organization in the counties of Estill, Lee, Wolf, and Breathitt. Gilbert assures Payne that Cockrell's seat in government will protect them should they be apprehended. Senator Cockrell is powerful but reckless. His brother Elijah is a county judge and their combined power makes them invincible. I mean, dude still serves in the Senate after catching bodies on election day. He and his friends murdered John Ross, James Dugan, and R.S. Sullivan at the voting precinct, and they're never arrested or prosecuted. If it's this easy for a murderous white supremacist to infiltrate the Capitol and undermine democracy, white speculators certainly aren't having a problem. A member of the Kentucky State Senate from 1863 to 1865, and again from 1869 to 1873, Cockrell is a member of the Agriculture and Manufacturing Committee. He and the state of Kentucky need mining in his home county of Estill to be successful to appease the furnace's wealthy investors and support the public. 
Estel's been trying to get investment in the furnace for a minute, searching high and low, far and wide. They find Fred Fitch right up the street in Lexington. Fred pours so much money into Red River Iron Works that it is soon expected to be the most profitable enterprise in the state. Securing emerging white wealth while dealing with the changing face of Southern life, Senator Cockrell must ensure that the money keeps flowing. In a surprise to no one, he uses his militia of terrorists to carry out his wishes. Stay tuned for part two of Operation 2052, The Speculator Strike Back, where Malia learns her assignment, the Joneses move out of Christian County, and One West, Steve Poe, and Craig Greenberg make a land grab to take the West End back. All right. I'll pass it on to you, Josh. Thank you all so much for joining us. I really appreciate the community researchers and all the time they put into this. Both of the works that you saw today were small pieces of much larger works. Mariel's will be uh, coming out in episodes and will culminate in a larger project of documenting the history of racial violence in Kentucky. And as Jessica said, Mir, uh, Woody's and Joy and Ace project will turn into a podcast. And so with that, we're pretty good on time. Uh, I'm going to make some closing remarks, but before I do that, um, we're going to open it up to Q&A. And so if you, have community, if you have questions for the panelists or the community researchers, please ask them. We do want to um, not center elected officials in this space. So I know there are a lot of questions for Jacory about the ordinance and y'all Jacory is a public servant who has a large platform and we'll be hosting town halls all over the city. So we wanna make sure we center our uh, comrades in the space and not Jacory. And I think Jacory is at the park with this child anyway. So I don't think that's a problem. Um, so yeah, if you have Q, if you have questions, post them in the chat. Um, I see one question about suggesting an organization in Florida for affordable housing. I'm not sure about that. Um, you can reach out to us on email and we can get back to you. I do see a question about, uh, I think this was in regards to Jacory's, uh, I think it was in regards to the Historically Black Neighborhoods Ordinance. And uh, I do wanna say about that ordinance, that ordinance, uh, some, of the, some of that ordinance was inspired by the work of Dr. Andrea Roberts at Texas A&M, who's working on the Texas Freedom Colonies Project down there. So we wanna make sure we acknowledge uh, her work in creating that. I do not think that there is another ordinance like that in the country. Um, another question we had was how do we create mixed income neighborhoods? And I'm gonna take that one um, just so we're clear on what we do and what our self interests are. We've knocked on a lot of doors of the past two years, um, a lot of doors of poor people. I have never heard, I've never knocked on a poor person's door and heard them say that they want rich people to come live next to them, that that's really a problem. What we hear from people is that they wanna stay in their homes. And so that's what we prioritize. When you unpack a lot of the rhetoric around mixed income neighborhoods and, 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 and um, that sort of narrative and that sort of ideology, you usually find that there are real estate interests pushing that narrative in some way. Martina, you had a question? Actually, I, I had a remark, uh, Josh. The issue of uh, mixed income neighborhoods, as you say, has been co-opted for political purposes and for purposes of power. However, those of us who are old enough do remember growing up in neighborhoods where you had a variety of people there. Your teachers lived in the neighborhood, the doctor lived in the neighborhood. And so those days are long past. There's nothing wrong with that. But it is important to, to point out that it's become sort of a sexy term that policymakers use to justify grant getting and, and other activities. They're so excited.
Thank you for that, Martina. I see Danette put into the chat, where can someone get involved? Uh, Danette, let's follow up with you one-on-one uh, -on -one sometime this week. Any other questions from the chat? Um, I have a question. Can I just go ahead and ask it? For sure. Um, where are the opportunities that you see? Um, I know you live in Louisville and you've talked about your Eastern Kentucky roots where folks out in Eastern Kentucky and folks in Louisville, um, where there's spaces where we can come together, share some space together, work on some things together so that we can continue building um, on those relationships from the from the city to the to out in Eastern Kentucky, rural Western Kentucky in those areas. Michael, were you addressing that to Jessica and I, or just anyone? Uh, any, any, anyone who, who has thoughts about how we can continue to work together across the geography? Well, I'll, I'll go ahead, um, and we've talked about this a little bit, Michael. I, I, think what, I think what the goal here for us is, and, and what we see a lot with the rural organizing, is to build up separate bases at first. As we build up those bases, win local fights, and build power locally, then we start connecting with each other and, and really try to build that statewide cross-racial solidarity for poor working class people and poor working class tenants specifically around housing. I think that's that's the goal. Um, and build, yeah, build power through our shared interest in social housing. Uh, here is a really good question um, for Mariel. What happened to Senator Cockle? Um. Well, let me first say that I chose Estill County for my research um, because I participated in the Kentucky Rural Urban Exchange. Um, and we visited Estill County and a bunch of us from Louisville asked, well, what happened to all the black people in Estill County? Why do no black people live here? And they didn't know. So I wanted to find out what happened to us in that space. Um, and Senator Cockrell um, uses the Klan um, to raid a camp of Black workers who had moved to the area um, for work in the mine. And um, he starts, he plans this raid on all of them and um, exterminates, um, displaces 400 uh, Black families from Estill County. So that is what happens to him next episode that's the next episode thank you muriel and angela had a really good question in response to my answer to michael it's like why do we have to wait why can't we connect and build across the state from the get-go and i think that might i think that might that question might require a meeting we can if we're ready um when you all think we're ready and we think we're ready we and i think we've been planting the seeds for that now but i know there are a lot of local battles to win before we can scale up And if, you'll, and if anybody else wants to chime in on that too, uh, go for it. Yeah, I think a good example of that, this is why I was curious, was um, we, were, we talked about TIFFs when I was talking about work in Rowan County. That work was informed by work that happened in Louisville around TIFFs, right? What are these things? How are they used and stuff like that? So I kind of in the spirit of what you were what you and Jessica were offering was kind of like well you need to have work on the table that we can make the connections with right if I'm just like out here but I'm not working on anything what what do I connect that's that's a good point and we don't have meetings just for the sake of having a meeting you know the point of a meeting is is to move work and so you know I guess to answer the question really is that we already are we're communicating but, at, you know, if you bring a problem to Jessica and I or bring a fight to Jessica and I and we have capacity and it's aligned with our self-interest, we're going to support that fight um, if it, you know, all over the state. So start a, start a fight. That's the answer. <laughs> uh, can I say something real quick? Sure. Uh, one thing I think we can do statewide right now is to watch our state legislature 
and be ready to let each other know issues of concern with the bills that they're coming up with. We do this, MPP does this every year. And then also watch the HBNA website. Uh, just kind of cruise around and see what's happening. There's a lot going on already, and we're already on some levels working towards the same aims. Um, but watch that legislature, folks. All right, y'all. Well, if there are no other questions, I'm going to, I really want to deeply thank Jerome Scott and our comrades who presented. When I was in my early 20s, I read the book, Detroit, I Do Mind Dying, by, uh, that documented the work of the revolutionary black workers and Jerome Scott. And that book had a really deep impact on me, especially that there are, are, there are alternatives to this sort of standard liberal electoral organizing that we see, and that most revolutionary activity actually happens outside the voting booth. And as I already said, we really wanna thank Clove the West and Eastern Kentucky Mutual Aid for their work. Uh, no, Eastern Kentucky did, didn't get, Eastern Kentucky Mutual Aid did not get to present today, but they do great work, you all. And so if anyone feels compelled to donate, like we said, uh, we love and appreciate donations, but please prioritize the mutual aid groups uh, in your donations. Their work supports our work. Thank you, Muriel, Woody, and Join A for your commitment, your creativity, and your perseverance. Um, we started the community research uh, program because we think poor and working class people should control the means of production for knowledge and data in their communities. And you all brought that idea to life. Um, these community research projects this year are deeply reflective of these folks' self-interest and their commitment to engaging in scholarship and building power in their communities. They are pissed off and they are tired of seeing developers and politicians subsidize their own displacement while police terrorize their communities. I do want to say, as Jerome mentioned also, and some other people mentioned, all of our organizing takes place within the context of January 6, 2021, and the rise of fascist movements around the world. We know exactly what we're fighting against. We're very fortunate to be paid organizers, and we do not take that lightly. Um, and we, we, we work to develop our practice, and we promise not to waste time on any initiative, meeting, or practice that is not directly aligned with our self-interest as welfare class and working class people. I do also want to say that we are organizers. We are not activists. That means that our work is relational. It's not transactional. We organize to agitate to get our desired outcomes for our people. The community research program is one way that we build power. We build power when we develop deep relationships around revolutionary study. We build power when we produce when we produce knowledge on top of those relationships, we build even more power. So if you're interested in building power for you and your people through research, please join us. The applications for next year's research incubator are up on the website and we'll be taking those in the next couple of months. There's no way we could possibly thank all the people who need to be thanked for their help over the past year or for the folks who influenced or inspired us. But I just personally really want to thank Talisha Wilson and Jessica Bellamy for the brilliance, principles, and com their commitment to revolutionary work. I work alongside some dope ass women, y'all, and it's been a privilege to organize around them. Um, this is what we're about. This is what we do. And we're not going to stop. Uh, I just want to I want to say when I, in 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 closing that our people deserve to win, and we thank you all for sharing this space with us. <laughs>